Okay, I think now it's done. And first, let me uh, briefly introduce Yan Rong. And Yan Rong is currently a senior lecturer at RS Plus, and her research interests include high dimensional statistics, large dimensional random matrix theory, large panel data analysis, and non parametric statistics. So now let us welcome her talk about can we trust PCA on non stationary data? Thank you, Tom. Uh, thanks for the, uh, this opportunity. Uh, today I want to talk about the uh, behavior of PCA on high dimensional non stationary data. Um, the, our conclusion is that uh, PC may be mislead, mislead us on such kind of complicated data. And this is a joint work with my academic, academic brother, uh, Dr. Bo Zhang, and my two supervisors, Professor Titi Kong and Professor Guang Minpan. Okay. Um, uh, this is the outline of my, of my talk. First, I will briefly introduce the problem. Uh, we will talk about the PCA on high dimensional non stationary data and its motivation. Uh, so, next, uh, we will focus on data structure and then establish the asymptotic theory for uh, the empirical argument values. Uh, of course, I will say. Um, why we want to uh, establish the asymptotic theory for uh, uh, empirical eigenvalues. They are really, uh, they are very close to uh, PCA. Uh, after that, we will use the developed theory to uh, two statistical application uh, to distinguish the uh, union, generalized union root process and the fact model. Um, at last, we will show some simulation and two empirical applications to demonstrate the finite sample performance of our proposed method and proposed statistic. Okay, um, so first uh, I will briefly introduce the problem, uh, PCA and high dimensional non-stationary data. As you know, um, PCA is a dimension reduction technique, right? Mm. For example, originally we have uh, small n random variables. Uh, because our small n, the dimension small n is very large compared, compared with our sample size capital T. In this case, maybe we need some dimension reduction technique to reduce the dimension of flexibility of this model. Uh, so PCA is a good technique. PCA can give us a new set of random variables denoted by Z. And the number of new random variables is capital M. Of course, here we hope that capital M is much smaller than our original dimension, small n. So in this case, our original random variables can be represented by our new random variables in this way. I think that you are very familiar with this representation. And this is the traditional PC representation. And from this representation, we can see that our new random variables found uh, in PC, they are common, um, are common features, yeah, or they are, they are shared by all the small n random variables yeah, because each random variable can be uh, written as a linear combination of the new random variables. Yeah. So um, from here, we can see that if in our data, uh, if we have small n random variables and they share some common information with each other, um, it is possible that PCA can give us some dimension reduction result. Uh, we can use the uh, reduced, uh, re uh, reducing dimensional uh, new random variables, Z, to represent the original uh, random variables. And this is a, a basic idea of PCA. Of course, the sense of uh, finding optimal uh, uh, new random variables in PCA is that our new random variables can keep the most variation of the original random variables. Yeah. Okay, so from here we can see that yeah, it is crucial that we can find the um, coefficients phi and the new random variables. Yeah. Uh, this is a graph <laughs> I copied from the uh, uh, the course static learning textbook. Yeah. And this, this graph can show the uh, idea I have introduced uh, of PC. We can see it br briefly. Uh, on this graph, we have two random variables, population and advertised spending. For these two random variables, we have some observations, which are the pink points on this graph. Uh, 
Now we conduct the PC with these observations. We can get two principal components. The first direction is the solid green line. The second one is the orthogonal, orthogonal direction, which is denoted by the dashed blue line. From here, we can see that uh, if we, we think that the first uh, principal component direction can keep the um, variation that satisfy our preference, uh, we can just keep the first principal component. Yeah. Um, from here, we can also see that piece, uh, the first principal component can keep the most variation of the, our data. Yeah. So uh, this graph can uh, illustrate the idea of PCA. Yeah. In practice, yeah, um, how to get the uh, PCA representation? Uh, usually, we conduct uh, uh, some eigen decomposition based on the sample covariance matrix. Yeah. Um, here, I use uh, capital S to denote the sample covariance matrix. Of course, uh, for simplicity, I assume that our data, the mean of our data is zero. Yeah? So the sample covariance uh, matrix is like this one. Yeah? Okay, so next, uh, if we conduct uh, again decomposition and get the again vectors and again values, we, we will get the PCA representation. Why? Because the again vectors of S will correspond to the uh, principal component directions, and the corresponding again values will are the variance of our new random variables uh, we, we have found in PCA. This is a formal procedure of PCA. From here, we can see that. PC has a close relationship with the identity composition of the sample covariance matrix. So this is why uh, in this paper we will talk about the uh, uh, the uh, asymptotic properties of eigenvalues of this matrix yeah, because uh, the eigenvalues can reflect some properties of our PC and uh, on some kind of data we care about. Okay. But there is a key uh, um, assumption here. In traditional PC, uh, why we can use the sample covariance matrix in, um, in the procedure? Because we, uh, we believe that the sample covariance matrix is a good estimator for the population covariance matrix. Yeah? Because the idea of PC is established on the population covariance matrix. Yeah? But in practice, this is an unknown parameter. So we should use some parameter estimator to estimate it. So sample covariance matrix is a traditional kind of estimator for population version. So we have used uh, the sample covariance matrix. Uh, of course, in traditional statistics, we have proved that uh, the dimension uh, with the, uh, in the fixed dimensional case, yeah, uh, which means that the dimension is fixed, yeah, and uh, and our sample uh, are quite a simple ID or stationary time series. We uh, we have known that the PCA procedure will produce good uh, estimation yeah, uh, for our data. Yeah. Uh, as well as some uh, asymptotic theory have been established. Uh, so this is a relationship between PC and uh, spectral analysis uh, for some matrix. Uh, okay, let's uh, go back to the uh, topic what I want to talk about today. Because I want to talk about PC on high dimensional non-stationary data, so our data have two kinds of host characteristics. The first one is high dimension. Uh, uh, second one is non-stationary. Yeah. So uh, first, uh, I uh, introduce the uh, the problem of PC on high dimensional data. Actually, there are many literature focus on such topic, um, but their uh, their examples are very simple, uh, are relatively formal. Uh, that they, they are seen, they have assumed that they are ID example observations or stationary time series. Um, for these cases. Yeah, um, if our dim uh, dimension is high, dimension high means that our uh, dimension small n is comparable to the sample size capital T or much larger than T uh, or smaller than T, but uh, uh, our small n should also go to infinity. Yeah. And this is three cases. Uh, um, how does, uh, how about the behavior of the uh, PC or archimedes or archimedes? Yeah. Um, actually, uh, in summary, uh, there are three quantities uh, uh, can affect the behavior of um, PC, um, which are the dimension, the sample size, and the uh, largest uh, eigenvalues. Yeah. 
because we uh, we are conducting PC, uh, uh, we assume that we can find a small uh, number of principal components to represent our original data. So it correspond. This result correspond to um, uh, to the phenomenon that our uh, sample covariance matrix have some largest uh, have um, finite number of largest eigenvalues. Yeah, which are much larger than the rest. Yeah. For this case, we call the largest part, yeah, largest part of the eigenvalues as spiked eigenvalues. Yeah, this is the definition of spike. I just uh, interpreted it briefly. Uh, these three quantities will uh, interplay, yeah, will play an important uh, role in the behavior of acting, acting, acting structures of the uh, thermal covariance matrix. There is a simple uh, result, which is a sufficient condition uh, uh, here, at least here. Uh, under this sufficient condition, we can get that the um, empirical eigenvalues, which we derived from the sample covariance matrix, are good, still good estimator for our for those of our population covariance matrix. Uh, let's look at this condition. Uh, this condition can show that. Um, these three quantities uh, interplay in the behavior of eigenvalues. Yeah. Um, from this condition, we can see that we don't hope the dimension too much because the dimension small n is in, uh, is in the numerator. Right? Um, the denominator is uh, our sample size is a product of capital T multiplies the, uh, the last sparked eigenvalue. Yeah, last sparked eigenvalue. Um, so from the denominator, we see that uh, if our sample size is larger, the better, right? Uh, larger, we can uh, we have more chance to make this condition satisfied. Um, if our spark the eigenvalue larger, it is also good. Yeah. So uh, there is a trade-off uh, here. Yeah. If our sample uh, dimension very large, yeah. Uh, 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 as well, if your uh, spark the eigenvalue very large, we can offset the high dimension. Yeah. So. Uh, from uh, I just want to use this condition to show you, to show you these three uh, quantities uh, can interplay um, in the behavior of eigenvalues for high dimensional data. Yeah. So this result is derived from uh, based on the ID observations of stationary time series, yeah, uh, which means that their sample observations are very good. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now I come back to our uh, problem. Uh, how about the PC on uh, high dimension non stationary data? We have additional property non stationary. Yeah. So um, for such complicated data, how about the behavior of PC? Yeah. Okay, uh, before uh, uh, we propose our uh, uh, method, yeah, I should talk about the motivation. Now, actually, the motivation is from the um, um, the PhD projects or honors projects yeah, in our school, um, the, um, many students work on mortality data. Yeah. I should thank uh, Hani and Fei, uh, who both go to Sydney, right? Um, yeah, because they instruct many students work on mortality data, so I have uh, been familiar with uh, such kind of data. Yeah, Fei told me that this data is very important in actual science, yeah, so um, I found that uh, this data is a high dimensional non stationary data, and uh, most the literature have used the PC to on such kind of data. So, this is why I want to uh, study it, uh, this data. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's look at this data. Uh, mortality data is high dimensional time series. Yeah. Uh, actually, it is a high dimensional non stationary time series. Not a uh, high dimensional non stationary time series. Yeah. Let's look at the structure of this data. Uh, this, uh, this table and uh, this table and these two graphs are from um, the thesis of, of one PhD uh, student. Yeah. Okay. Um, this table describes the, the uh, data structure. Yeah. The historical data is our mortality data. Um, this is a high dimensional time series data. Uh, at each year, uh, we observed the death rate for many ages, yeah, from, the age, from age zero to age 19. Yeah. Um, so uh, from here, we can see that the dimension is 91. Yeah. Uh, for this high dimensional time series, we have observations from the year 
1973 to 2016. Yeah. Um, so from here, we can see that the dimension small n equal to 91, but our thumb size gap capital T equal to uh, 84. Yeah. Um, the dimension, yeah, 91 is larger than 84, so obviously it is a high dimensional data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so they told me that uh, the mortality forecasting is very important for uh, in actual science. Yeah. So with uh, the aim of studying this data is to um, give some model and to conduct the forecasting uh, with the historical data. Yeah. So we want to forecast to, uh, the death rate in the, in the future years. This is the um, aim of mortality data analysis. Yeah. But uh, uh, now in uh, uh, today, I, I will not focus on the forecasting. We will focus on analyze the PCA uh, historical data. Yeah. Why we care about the PCA historical data? Yeah. Uh, let's look at here. This is a benchmark paper in actual science. Actually, it is published on JASA, which is a top uh, static journal. Um, in this paper, uh, uh, they give a model and then forecasting. Uh, the mortality data in US. Yeah. Uh, I briefly introduced the model uh, uh, proposed in this paper. Yeah. Uh, actually, this paper uses the PCA or factor model yeah, because uh, sometimes yeah, PCA is equivalent uh, to factor model in some sense. Right? Um, they use this model to describe the uh, historical data. Let's look at this model, the way it is our mortality data. Yeah. Uh, the right part is a factor model, Ft is the common factor, kappa i is the uh, uh, corresponding, um, uh, uh, corresponding uh, factor loading. Uh, uh, of course, this part is an error part. Uh, the idea of this factor model is same as PC, uh, uh, because uh, where it i from uh, 1 to 19y, it is a high dimension time series, we cannot give a forecasting model directly because the dimension is too high. The yeah, crystal dimensionality will uh, appear if we use a traditional time series, uh, time series model. So we use this model to, uh, to conduct the dimension reduction first. Yeah. Uh, in, uh, in this paper, uh, FT is one dimension. Yeah. On our mortality data, the number of common factors yeah, or the number of principal components is one. So with this model, we have reduced the dimension from 19.1 to one. Yeah. So we have reduced the dimension yeah, with large, uh, a large extent. Yeah. Um, so next, uh, how to uh, forecast the, how to forecast the mortality data with this model? Uh, uh, in this paper, we give forecasting model on FT and get the forecasting result uh, for uh, for the future times of F. Yeah, uh, with the forecasting result on F, we can recover the forecasting for the original high dimension time series or mortality data. This is the idea of the Likert model, which is proposed in that paper. Yeah. Um, this model is very clear and simple. Yeah. Uh, also, it is very important because the result is very good for um, mortality data in US. Yeah. But we find a problem. Yeah. Um, this kind of data is not stationary from this graph. Yeah. This graph plots the time series from the each time series. Yeah. Uh, so each curve corresponds to the uh, time series of each age. Yeah. Uh, so from the uh, uh, from, from the light color yeah, to the deep color, yeah, uh, from young age to old age. So from this graph, we can see that the, uh, uh, the mortality data is non-stationary time series, yeah, yeah, obviously. Yeah. Okay, uh, so this is stimulate us to study um, uh, how about the PCA on high dimensional non-stationary data because in the first step, Liz Likert has used the PC to recover FT and kappa i. Yeah, so um, we want to um, we want to see why uh, PC is feasible on such kind of data. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the second graph uh, plots the uh, another direction. Yeah. Each each curve represents the um, death rate of all ages at each year. Yeah. So from this graph, we can see that the uh, death rate of all ages have, uh, 
have a strong relationship with each other. Yeah. Uh, this is why uh, Hanley's students can um, use functional data to, um, to study mortality data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, based on this motivation, um, our uh, question is, can we trust the uh, feature selected uh, from the PCA procedure on such kind of high dimensional non-stationary data? This is a crucial problem. Uh, before you introduce the um, theory, we, I want to show you a, a simulation result. Uh, uh, I conduct a simulation to see whether, uh, to, uh, to explore the, whether the features from PC is, uh, is uh, trustable or uh, reasonable. Yeah. Uh, actually, from simulation, we can see that uh, uh, under some cases, yeah, maybe PCA is misleading our high dimensional station data. Yeah. Let's look at this simulation. Yeah. Uh, the data generating process yeah, uh, is this one. Yeah. Uh, we generate a high dimensional uh, time series. Yeah. Uh, for this high dimensional time series, it includes the two factors, yeah, two factor model, uh, two factor models. Um, F1, T, F2, T are two factors. Yeah. Uh, the corresponding L, L, R1, L, I2 are the factor loadings. Yeah. Uh, this is the error component. Yeah. So if, uh, if L is not equal to zero, of course, we have two factors, right? Um, to keep uh, our data ha uh, has uh, time series behavior, yeah, we generate the factor FT from the uh, AR1 type <laughs> time series. Yeah as well as for uh, our error component. Yeah. But to the row and gamma are two parameters, so we, I will give them different values yeah, um, in the simulation. Yeah. Okay, um, let's look at this graph. Yeah. Uh, in this graph, yeah, this graph plots the archivalues of the sample covariance matrix. Yeah. As you know, the archivalues of sample covariance matrix I mean, the thermal covariance matrix can tell us that whether the, uh, our data has principal component. Right? Yeah, if some eigenvalues are very large, yeah, uh, this phenomenon indicates that we have some uh, principal component can be extracted from our data. Okay, let's look at here. Um, for this graph, yeah, actually I set the loadings equal to zero. Yeah, I set the loadings L, uh, the L equal to zero. Under this case, the, uh, our data equal to the error component. Yeah. So now, uh, because the error component, yeah, on the, uh, on the cross-sectional di dimension, yeah, a cross-sectional means for different i, yeah, for different i, uh, the y are independent uh, due to the, uh, generation, uh, data generating, the data generating process. Yeah. So for this case, yeah, uh, there is no common features for our data. Yeah. Um, the, the, the dimension is set equal to 20 and gamma size equal to 14. Yeah. Um, here gamma is set to be equal to one. Equal to one means that the error is the uni root. Yeah. So the, our original data is a uni root because this part has disappeared. Yeah. So now we don't have common factors. Yeah. If we don't have common factors, if we want to use PCA on this kind of data, yeah. actually uh, we hope that PCA can tell us that there is no common feature existed in this data, right? Yeah, but we, uh, we uh, conduct a PCA, we look at the eigenvalues of the sample covariance matrix. We found that there is one very large eigenvalue, yeah, very large eigenvalue here, located here. The second is not, uh, yeah, uh, it's much smaller than this one, but larger than that one. Yeah. So from this graph, yeah, um, the PCA procedure tell us that there is at least one principal component. But actually, in our case, we don't have any principal component because the data has no common feature, uh, no common factors or common features. Okay, let's look at the second um, second case. In the second case, yeah, um, I uh, I set the uh, factor loadings not equal to zero. They are generated from normal distribution. So uh, for our model, we have two true common factors. Yeah, we have two true common factors. Um, 
our dimension T, uh, in some sense, is 20 and it's 14. Uh, it is it belongs to a high dimensional uh, setting. Our rho and gamma are both smaller than one. So this case, our data is stationary. Yeah, it is stationary. So this is a high dimensional stationary. Uh, the, uh, this is uh, eigenvalue eigenvalue behavior of subcovalence matrix. From here, we can see that we have two large eigenvalues, yeah, uh, which is which is the same as our uh, the number of true common factors. So this graph shows that when the uh, when our data is stationary, you know, we can get the correct information from the uh, eigenvalues of sample covariance matrix. Okay, um, if uh, if we uh, still have two true common factors, uh, but uh, uh, I said the error component is uh, is non-stationary. The factor part is stationary. So totally, the original data is non-stationary, right? Under this case, yeah, from this graph, we can see that we only have one principal component because the rest are very small com compared with this one. Yeah. But the true case is that we have two. Yeah. So PC in uh, in PC, the PC procedure tells us we only have one. So this is also a misleading information from PCA because it is a high dimensional non stationary data. Okay, um, uh, this is phenomenon is the same because I just changed the row of the gamma. Yeah? Now, in this case, the factor is non stationary and the error is stationary. Okay, let's look at the extreme case. The factor and the uh, error component are both non stationary. For this case, yeah, we still have one principal component from the procedure, but the true case is two. So, from this uh, simulation, I want to show that we have maybe we can get some misleading information from the um, from the PCA uh, when we apply them to uh, high dimensional stationary data. Yeah. Okay, mm, so uh, this phenomenon and uh, motivation from the uh, empirical analysis uh, uh, stimulate us to um, uh, study the behavior of uh, eigenvalues of the sample covariance matrix. Yeah. Um, why? Because um, we uh, from this the phenomenon we have known that the sample covariance mat uh, matrix, yeah, the eigenvalues of sample covariance matrix cannot reflect the uh, true uh, the population eigenvalues uh, exactly or correctly. Yeah. So uh, what I, what are the behavior of the such uh, empirical eigenvalues? Yeah, this is the aim of our um, uh, of our study. So. Uh, First, we should specify a data structure yeah, because we we can uh, usually we we uh, develop a theory we can uh, we can only work on um, a kind of uh, data structure. And this data structure is popular in random matrix theory, which is called the separable covariance data structure. Uh, let's look at this structure first. This structure first. Yeah. Okay, our original data is denoted by capital Y. Yeah. So capital Y is the dimension of capital Y is T capital T by small n. Yeah. Small n is still our dimension. Capital T is our sum size. Yeah. Uh, this is our data structure. Yeah. In this data structure, we have three parts. And the, the left part is a deterministic matrix. Yeah. The right part is also a deterministic matrix. Only the middle part is random. Yeah. Uh, I introduce the middle part first. The middle part X. Yeah. X uh, is a t, t plus L uh, times n dimensional random matrix. Yeah. Uh, in X, so, uh, it involves the elements in X are ID. Yeah. This is an ID. Um, gamma is a uh, Actually, uh, the idea of this uh, this data structure is that um, first the point is that our original data can be written as some linear combination of uh, ID data yeah. uh, from the aspect of um, statistical technique. Yeah, it is much simpler. We can recall the uh, Gaussian distribution. As you know, the Gaussian data can be written as a linear combination, uh, can, can be written as a um, linear combination of ID data, right? Yeah, so uh, from uh, in view of this, this data structure is much easier for uh, technical study. 
um, actually, um, we can use, we want to use gamma and omega as a two deterministic matrix to describe the uh, uh, dependence uh, uh, along the uh, sample observations and along the dimension. Yeah. Actually, gamma is used to describe the dependence uh, along the sample observations. Yeah. Uh, because the gamma is on the left, it is a t-dimensional. Yeah. It is almost a t-dimensional. Yeah. The omega is on the right, which can describe the, um, the cross-sectional dependence along the dimension. Yeah. So omega is n small n by n. By n. Uh, our sigma is uh, gamma multiplied gamma transforms, transform. Uh, so this is a t by t matrix. Yeah. Um, uh, so If our sigma equal to identity matrix, yeah, if our sigma equal to identity matrix, our data, yeah, um, um, if our data is uh, generated from a uh, factor model, yeah, actually, uh, this kind of data can be written as a, a separable uh, covariance data structure, which is this one. Yeah. Uh, why? Let's uh, look at this point briefly. Our data structure can be written as of, this is a fact model, this is a residual part, yeah. F is a factor, yeah. C is a um, ID um, error component, yeah, because we hope that in our error component, we uh, the, the sample, in the sample domain, our sample observations are um, time series, so we use the, that we have a W here, which is a de deterministic matrix to describe the um, uh, correlation among the sample observations. Yeah, so our Y can be written into this form. Yeah, um, so uh, we can calculate omega as this one and uh, uh, sigma equal to I, which is specified. So under this case, the factor model with ID data can be written as the uh, special form of the um, separable covariance data model. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, if omega equal to I, which means that uh, for in the uh, along the dimension with um, the cross sections have no relationship with each other. Yeah. Under this case, yeah, uh, if we consider a linear process, yeah, which means that for this hard dimensional time series, each time series is a linear process, and this time, the, any two time series have no relationship with each other. So for this case, yeah, um, this kind of data can still be written as the separable covariance data structure. Yeah. So in, the, in view of this, you know, this data structure is a more generalized uh, data structure. Yeah. Uh, why we call it the separable covariance uh, matrix data structure? Because the covariance matrix of such kind of data can be written as this one. Yeah. Mm, the covariance matrix, uh, sample covariance matrix equal to this one. Yeah. X is random, uh, gamma is user to the, the, uh, uh, you can treat gamma as a covariance of the uh, sample observations, uh, omega as the covariance, our, the population covariance matrix describe our, uh, the relation along the dimension. Yeah. Actually, when we conduct a PC, we hope that our S, yeah, because in PC we use the sample covariance matrix S, we want to use S to uh, mimic the eigenvalues of the matrix omega, right? Uh, we want to uh, mimic the uh, approximate the uh, eigenvalues of the matrix omega. Yeah. But if we have gamma here, yeah, if we have gamma here, I want to show you that the eigenvalues of gamma will, will interrupt the behavior of eigenvalues of S. Yeah. Maybe uh, in some extreme case, when the eigenvalues of gamma are very large, yeah, the eigenvalues of S will approximate the eigenvalues of gamma instead of eigenvalues of omega. Yeah, so this is a finding from the established theory. Uh, we, we will see this point later. Okay. Uh, 
So this is an interpretation of the data structure. Yeah, the omega describes the cross-sectional dependence, which is the, uh, the Euro, uh, which is a Euro population covariance matrix. Uh, but our data, our sample observation are not very good. We have a gamma to describe the uh, dependence along the sample observations. Yeah, so our sample covariance can be written into this form. Uh, under this case, yeah, we want to uh, borrow this uh, simple data structure to describe the, uh, how does the uh, uh, dependence among the sample, of sample observations in gamma affect the behavior of the eigenvalues in S, uh, for S. Yeah. So this is, a, uh, this is the aim of uh, our established asymptotic theory. Okay, let's look at the uh, asymptotic theory. Um, I, uh, because uh, uh, the assumptions are very uh, complicated, so I introduced the idea briefly. Um, do you remember that we have two deterministic uh, matrix, sigma and omega? Uh, sigma describes the uh, dependence along the sample observations. Omega is our population covariance matrix we care about, right? We want to use S to uh, approximate omega yeah, instead of sigma. Yeah. So now in order to uh, study the, the phenomenon, we assume that the eigenvalues of sigma, yeah, which means that the eigenvalues along the uh, sample observations yeah, have sparked the structure, which means that uh, sigma has some large eigenvalues, yeah, sigma has some large eigenvalues, uh, finite number of large eigenvalues which are uh, much larger than the rest. Yeah, so which means that the sigma has a sparked covariance structure. Yeah, so uh, for example, uh, this condition yeah, is, uh, is used to describe the left uh, eigenvalue, some of our left eigenvalues is much smaller than the uh, sparked eigenvalues because the mu k is a case largest eigenvalue. Yeah, so this is this assumption. The second assumption is imposed on the omega. Yeah, omega is our population covariance matrix. Yeah. Mm. For omega, we don't assume it has uh, too much spike structure, yeah, uh, because we want to. Our aim is to um, to see whether the sigma, see how does the sigma affect S, yeah, the covariance matrix. So uh, for omega, we assume the effective rank yeah, satisfying this condition. Uh, uh, so from this condition, we can see that the sum, the, the numerator is the sum of all eigenvalues, the denominator is the, uh, the largest eigenvalue, right? Uh, so from here, we can see that the largest comparable with the sum of eigenvalues, the largest eigenvalue is not very large, yeah, because uh, it's in the ratio 10 to infinity. Yeah. So uh, roughly speaking, this condition uh, means that our uh, Spike, uh, spike the characteristic in omega is not very strong, yeah. but in sigma, uh, the spike is very strong. Yeah. In this case, yeah, uh, we have established the, the um, asymptotic distribution for our sample, uh, for our eigenvalues of the sample covariance matrix S. Yeah. Lambda is a sample eigenvalue of sample covariance matrix. Mu is the eigenvalue of the sigma. Yeah. So from here, you know, we can see that the eigenvalue, you know, the normalized eigenvalue will tend to normal distribution, approximate normal distribution. Yeah, you know, we have given the uh, asymptotic mean equal to zero, asymptotic covariance equal to this one. Yeah, you know, because we have repeated the eigenvalue here, so this is why we have several uh, ni repeated eigenvalue involved here. Yeah, for this uh, theorem, I want to interp uh, interpret. Um, uh, one point, yeah. Uh, from here, we can see something, yeah. Uh, uh, based on some simple calculation, we can see that this uh, standard, uh, standard error is uh, smaller than the mean here, yeah. This part is larger than the inverse of this part, uh, the square root of the inverse of this part, yeah. So uh, we can get that uh, lambda is approximate to this value. Yeah. If lambda approximate to this value, we can see this point, right? Mm, from here, we can see that yeah, if, 
uh, if our omega has no spiked structure and uh, simply omega equal to identity, there is no common factors in, in our data, right? So this part equal to one. Yeah, this theorem shows that the empirical eigenvalue, eigenvalue of the sample covariance matrix will approximate the eigenvalue of the uh, sigma. You know, sigma is to describe the dependence along the sample observations. Yeah. So from here, we can see that the empirical eigenvalue lambda cannot reflect the eigenvalue of omega, yeah, which describes the uh, cross-sectional dependence, yeah, which is uh, M in PCA. So uh, this thing will also tell us that we say maybe misleading in such kind of data. Yeah. Okay. Um, Let's look at another proposition. Another proposition tells tell, uh, tell us uh, another, another relationship with the uh, empirical eigenvalue and the eigenvalues of, the, of sigma. Yeah. The ratio of successive empirical eigenvalue yeah, will approximate the, so the, the, that of the um, eigenvalue, uh, ratio of successive eigenvalues of sigma yeah, instead of omega. So here, yeah, this one is uh, will be very useful to demonstrate that some um, ratio test statistic to test the number of eigenvalues will fail, yeah, because uh, the ratio test statistic will use such kind of statistic, yeah, but the such kind of statistic will will reflect the relation of uh, eigenvalues of sigma instead of omega, yeah. So this is. Uh, this also shows that PC will be misleading. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, this one or uh, is this prop proposition is the CLT for uh, the ratio statistic, yeah, um, which tells us that this statistic will have the asymptotic distribution as this one. This one is not a common used uh, distribution, but it is uh, very simple. Each random variable here is an ID uh, standard normal distribution. Yeah, so in late Later, we will propose the statistic based on this CLT. Yeah. In practice, we will um, mimic the uh, or approximate the uh, quantize of the asymptotic distribution. Yeah. Okay, um, so from the established theory, we, can, uh, we have shown that the eigenvalues of the uh, sample covariance matrix may be misleading yeah, because it will reflect the eigenvalues uh, behavior of eigenvalues of sigma instead of omega. Yeah. Omega is our um, the population covariance matrix we care about in PC. Yeah. So this is a conclusion from the established uh, theory. Okay, um, due to time limit, I uh, introduced uh, some important and uh, some uh, interesting results. Yeah. Based on the theory, we have given two statistical applications. Uh, uh, the first application is to demonstrate some uh, common use uh, um, statistic uh, or estimator, which are used to estimate the number of principal components or the number of common factors uh, uh, will fill on such kind of data because they have, for example, they have used the ratio. Yeah. Because for our data, the ratio, we have, I have said that the ratio will approximate the ratio of uh, eigenvalues uh, of sigma yeah, uh, instead of omega. So this one will misleading. Yeah. If our data has no factor, this, uh, but our sigma has uh, sparked eigenvalues, this, uh, this statistic will tell us that the data has some principal component. Actually, it has no common factors or principal component. So uh, this is our first uh, statistical application. We have numerated some common use uh, and important uh, criteria in statistics. Yeah, there, are, there are a few um, on the high dimensional non-stationary non data. Uh, another application is that um, uh, because uh, we have said the separable covariance structure, uh, data structure is too complicated. And so here we give a, a special model. <laughs> we give a special model, which is a generalized uh, uni, uni root model. Yeah, because the error component is a linear process, it is a stationary linear process. Yeah, so this is why I say it uh, a generalized uh, uni root model. Uh, this model can be written as 
can be written as the separable covariance uh, model. Yeah, uh, by some calculation, we can show that it can be written as this one. So HCW here, yeah, the product is our gamma. Yeah, we have omega here. Yeah. For this, uh, for this generalized unit root model because it is a special case of our, our, our separable covariance data. Yeah, so we, uh, we, can, we can get the results uh, from the established theory, right? Yeah, we, uh, for, for the generalized unit root, we also have the CLT for the eigenvalue, yeah, uh, which is similar as the theorem one. Yeah. Um, but I want to introduce here, yeah, because the previously we have uh, established the CLT for the ratio, right? But in the ratio, we have involved the uh, eigenvalues of the sigma. But in practice, we don't know the eigenvalue of sigma. But, uh, for generalized the unit root, we can calculate the, uh, we, we have known the structure, so we can calculate the, um, uh, uh, the sigma for you generalize the unit root the sigma uh, uh, the eigenvalues of sigma are approximated as this one you know these are constant and this is a deterministic value so we construct a new statistic yeah as this one uh, we will uh, find that this new statistic will also uh, uh, approximate this distribution yeah, this uh, sequential distribution yeah. Uh, later, we will use this statistic to do some test. But here, another point I want to mention is here. For general, generalized uni root, uh, we, we have this result. Yeah, with the probability one, we, uh, we found that the, uh, the, the number of eigenvalue, yeah, the number of common factor equal to one. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what is this one? This one is used in the here. Yeah, this is a yeah, and the Horizon paper. Yeah, they they use this criteria, this estimator as a uh, estimation for the number of common factors. Yeah, okay. So this proposition means that for generalized the unit root model, and um, with probability one, the, this value is always equal to one. Yeah. So this means that for generalized the unit root model, yeah. Um, if you use this criteria to estimate the number of principal components, yeah, it is equal to one. Yeah. So it, uh, if we, we believe it, we think that there is one principal component or one common factor inside uh, existing in the data. Actually, we don't have, yeah, uh, because it is a generalized unit root model, it's only by equal to i. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, with this, uh, this proposed statistic, we can, uh, we can distinguish the fact model and the unit root, uh, uh, generalized unit root model, uh, because the uh, fact model can be written as this one, a you know, uh, similar form of the generalized unit root model. Yeah, so our null hypothesis is a generalized unit root model. Alternative is the fact model. We can use the, uh, proposed uh, the ratio statistic, uh, which follows uh, the asymptotic strange distribution. Yeah, this one uh, to do this hypothesis test. Is the data follows the fact model. This uh, follows a single fact model. Single fact model means that there is only one factor in the data. Our test statistic will approximate uh, to infinity. Yeah. From here, we can see that our power equal, uh, approximate to one. Yeah, because you know, uh, you know, under the null hypothesis, yeah, we have a, a non-infinite uh, distribution. Yeah. Okay, um, our simulation ha uh, has shown, I uh, give two simulation. One is a unit root, uh, generalized unit root model, and another one is a core factor model. When uh, the simulation result has shown that the signs and power are both uh, fine. Yeah. Because you can look at here, the, the two sides test the power when nt go to infinity, the power is good. Yeah. Okay, um, so this is a factor model. Yeah. Uh, the power will approximate to one yeah, when it equal to infinity. Okay, so I use one minute, one or two minutes to uh, look at our empirical application. Yeah. In our empirical application, we gave two examples. The first example is uh, uh, the OECD data from the 
uh, ecometrics. Yeah. Um, another data is our US mortality data we have introduced earlier. Uh, so uh, for the OECD data, yeah, there is a popular uh, panel data model to describe this data, uh, which is this one. Uh, in this data, our response is a healthcare expenditure. Uh, also, we have some predictors. Yeah. Uh, for example, the GDP is a proportion of, old, uh, proportion of young people, proportion of older people, and the government funding on uh, healthcare expenditure. Yeah. We have four uh, predictors. Um, but in econometrics, uh, researchers think that the error components still have some common features which, can, which are not observed. So they use a, a fact model to describe the residual. Uh, um, so now we conduct, can conduct our test. We use our statistics to test whether the residual has uh, uni root, uh, generalized the uni root structure or fact model structure. Okay. So this is a procedure of unit uh, test. So let's look at the result for the residual. The residual is uh, de derived from the um, regression, yeah, de estimated from the regression. So we can look at here for the residual, our uh, test will reject the non-hypothesis, uh, reject non-hypothesis. So uh, roughly speaking, we think that it is, uh, uh, our conclusion is uh, it, it follows the fact model, yeah, because non hypothesis is a uh, generalized uni root model, yeah, uh, which shows that the, uh, the, the, the fact model imposed on the residual uh, is reasonable on the, our test. Yeah. Okay, let's, at last, let's look at the mortality result. Yeah, we were, uh, for this mortality data, we have said that some dimension is 91, some science is 84. Uh, so here we conduct the, our test. Yeah, um, our conclusion is false, means that we reject the non hypothesis. We think that on, on the our setting, we think that there is one common factor in our in the mortality data. So uh, at a very small aspect, we think that uh, mortality data. Uh, yeah, uh, this this set of mortality data. Uh, if we use a uh, fact model to model it, it is reasonable, okay. So this is uh, two empirical applications. Yeah. So uh, from this talk, I will, uh, we have established the theory for the spectrum eigenvalues of some covariance matrix, yeah, uh, which is based on very, uh, very general data structure. Yeah. Uh, actually, hard dimensional uh, non-stationary data is one kind of uh, this data structure. Uh, this this separable covariance structure yeah. uh, in random matrix it uh, yeah it has a, a this is one interesting uh, result in uh, random matrix random matrix theory but uh, when we apply it to high dimensional time theory I think it is more interesting yeah. okay um, so in the future we will. Uh, as you know, argument only describes the one aspect of the uh, PC. So uh, the more important part is the argument. So as future work, we will uh, talk about the asymptotic uh, theory of argument for such kind of matrix. Okay, I think I should stop here today. Sorry, I used too much time for the talk. Uh, okay, any question? So any questions for Yan Rong? So, so Yan Rong, I, I have a question. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so okay. um, so uh, I, I think I, I really enjoy your talk. I think your theory actually solves uh, a lot of uh, concerns. I think when I first look at the Lee Carter's uh, work about uh, to use the uh, factor model to fit the unit root process. So uh, I, I have several questions. So one question is about your test. Uh, okay. so, so your test is basically uh, to test whether or not it's unit root or to use the factor model, right? Yeah, right. So yeah, if the test shows us to use the factor model, then the Lee Carter's uh, approach is appropriate, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, however, if it's, um, so basically if the t test tells us to use the unit root model, then we can, we can we can never use the, the ratio based estimation to determine uh, how many uh, principal components we should use, right? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, the theory has shown that the, yeah, the ratio test statistic may be, may be misleading, right? Yeah, um, yeah, so we, we cannot use this one to, uh, to detect the how many, number, uh, how many uh, fa common factor uh, or principal components in the data. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so from my understanding, I think uh, the test is quite important. So it can actually, yeah. in real practice, help us to determine uh, which method we should use, right? Yeah, right, yeah. Uh, you mean uh, that uh, this one is more important than uh, that one, right? When they determine the number of... Uh, yeah, yeah, because we need to, yeah. we need to perform okay. the test first before, before we perform the ratio-based estimation. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. In practice, yeah, we should do it, yeah, in this order. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so from my understanding, I think that's the most, uh, uh, I think, striking contribution, I think, in real practice. And my second question is about the, the unit, the unit root process or, or maybe just a simple random work, right? So for simple yeah. random work, we can actually write down the gamma matrix, the, the kind of the, uh, the covariance matrix, right, for the yeah. unit root yeah. process. So yeah. from my understanding, I think the unit root process has the uh, ACOF, I think, increasing uh, linear, linearly, right? So in that case, we can actually write down the gamma matrix, right? So, yeah. so in that case, the gamma matrix does not satisfy the, the spiked uh, assumption, right? Uh, you, you mean for unit root, where the gamma satisfies the spike property, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. It, it, it satisfies. Yeah. It satisfies. Yeah, this is why we have, uh, yeah, you can look at here, uh, the gamma matrix is ATCW line. And uh, actually, uh, it satisfies our uh, assumption that uh, the gamma matrix has a sparked eigenvalue. Yeah. So this is why we, in our result, we have one, uh, uh, we have one sparked eigenvalue in, uh, in our S. Uh, if sigma is, if gamma is not spiked, if sigma is not spiked, uh, yeah, we, uh, our result will not uh, correct. Yeah, thank you so much. So any more questions? Yeah, I don't have a question, Tal, but could I make a comment to Yanron? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Yanron. Um, that was nicely explained. I, I found equation 11 very striking, and I, I like the um, emphasis yeah. you gave to it because it both, it both showed very directly what you're trying to estimate, namely the eigenvalues of omega, and what you're actually estimating and how gamma comes in and messes up your um, yeah. attempt. So that at an intuitive level, um, I felt mm. that equation 11 really summed up. Oh, oh sorry, equation 11, okay. Yeah, that one. Oh. That summed up, that sort of clarified lots of things and summed up what you're trying to do and why it's difficult. So um, I appreciated the time you spent on explaining your setup. Um, and I think that was a very nice way of doing it. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, I feel very difficult to explain this one, this complicated model uh, more uh, intuitively. Yes, yeah, so we should use some example to show this point. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, uh, let us thank Yan Rong again for her very interesting talk. And thank you all for joining this uh, seminar today. And next week, we are going to have another Zoom seminar and the notification has been sent. And please take care and stay well and safe and see you next week. Uh, if you are willing to, I think you can uh, keep on uh, saying hi or chat with Yan Rong if you want to for several minutes. And thank you. See you next week. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Francis. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Yan Rong. Mm -hmm.